morning, everyone. What a joyful day. That song we just sang has so much power and glory and joy in it. And we're also very joyful in the wake of last night's Celebrating the Divine in All, in which we welcomed spring. Um, we blessed our CSA's expansion, and we also welcomed back a number of pilgrims who have been traveling to India. And um, I'm going to just speak a few moments on the topic this morning and then invite Sriman McGilloway, co-director of Ananda here in Seattle, to come up and share some more with us. So the question today is, um, who is this son of man? Was Jesus human? Was he divine? And I think the answer to that is that he was fully human, that he had over many incarnations through his dedication and finally drawing on the grace of God, had become fully awakened in God and now came back as all the masters do, as Buddha did and as the yogi Christs, as Yogananda, whose teachings we follow here, called them the yogi Christs of India, came back out of compassion for the rest of us who are still more identified with the little, our human bodies. And so we see here this wonderful, dramatic life of Jesus, as they said um, in the reading, you know, smiles one day and then opprobrium and eventually crucifixion the next, and then finally that resurrection. But, oh, I just lost my train here of thought, that what Jesus embodied, son of man, born as we all are, out of a human body and coming into this small little self. The difference between us and Jesus is that he, as uh, one of Yogananda's disciples said, is one of degree, not of kind. We have not yet fully awakened as he did to the fact that he, that we are all children of God and can all potentially and will eventually feel ourselves, realize ourselves as being one with all creation, one with the entire cosmos and a part of that, and able to experience and express that. So the masters come back to help us. And as the um, reading says, even their sorrow is not for themselves. Jesus in his weeping was weeping, you can imagine, who among us has not had someone in our family or perhaps a child who we can see is making some mistake over and over again, and yet, what can we do? You know, we can't transgress upon their free will, and yet we sorrow for them because we know that there is another way, and so it is with these great masters out of their great compassion for us, they feel the sorrow that we are not yet fully experiencing that wonderful divinity. There's a little story of Yogananda even, um, one of his disciples, Kriyananda, who began Ananda. Um, actually, maybe he, it wasn't he who was involved in the story, but someone came upon him weeping and was very surprised because the master was always joyful. And he said, I'm weeping because one of your brothers will leave the path. And yet, Kriyananda said that no matter when he looked at Yogananda, even in experiences like that, or at times when Yogananda had to discipline people, even at times when he was laughing, he would see Kriyananda would see in his eyes this fathomless, deep joy. That's the Son of God, that experience of, of the, the, um, the bliss of God embodied in the Son of Man, in a human incarnation. And it's up to us, of course, when we're going to turn back and start that journey back to understanding, experiencing our own divinity. And I know everyone in this, this room has made that turn or you wouldn't be here. So I wanted to just end with just a few remarks because sometimes there can be that feeling 
that, you know, here I am on the path and I know I'm supposed to be a child of God. I'm told I'm a child of God and I'm not feeling it right now. What can I do this moment? I like to bring things down. These lofty talks, I sort of like my head starts to spin because I think, well, what about now? And so I um, wanted to share with you just a few things. I've been, had the great privilege of teaching with uh, Jamana Snick and my Swami Jamana uh, class this um, month, two classes on practicing the presence of God. And I had to admit, when I started to uh, work on the class, she and I got together and she talked to me about some experiences she'd been having with it. And I, <laughs> I started feeling like this. <laughs> I said, well, maybe you should just teach the class and I'll just sit there. <laughs> and it made me realize I had kind of let go of that practice. And, um, but then when I started to tune in, the class gave me the, just the excuse I needed, even though I thought I was too busy, to tune into that practice and bring it back into my life. And we concentrated on two, two saintly folks, um, Brother Lawrence and um, Frank Laubach, who wrote um, Letters from a Modern Mystic. And through the beautiful practices that they suggested of just talking with God or talking with a master to whom you feel close, a saint, just bringing them into your daily life, you can start to experience once again that contact, that spark of the divine that informs all of life and that gives you that pathway back. We have a, a beautiful song that Swami Kriyananda wrote about this turning back and one of the lines in it speaking about God and, and perhaps about Jesus is... Um, he can redeem you from every evil. Friend, only think of him. Walk by his side. And in those two lines, friend, only think of him. Walk by his side contains the nutshell of almost everything we need to do. We have our meditation. But when we're not in meditation, thinking of God, this gentleman, Frank Laubach, said that we rarely have just one thought. We usually have two thoughts in relationship to one another, and he decided he would make God one of those thoughts that's in relationship to something else. So I'm worried about this project I have. How can God help me? I'm having a difficulty with this person in my life. What would God do? I am experiencing disappointment. God, how can I meet you in this? Always taking that opportunity to bring God's presence in. And then walk by his side, asking God to be with you at all times, to guide your footsteps, to walk along with you, show you the way, show you how to deal with each situation. And finally, this gentleman used to literally take walks with God, and it's a practice that I recommend highly. And he said that any hour could become full of the glory of God when he did that. When he walked with God, sharing the experience, every hour became luminescent with that joy. I'd like to invite Freeman up now to talk a little bit more about the Yogi Christ of India and their experiences on the pilgrim and to help us tune into that joy. Thank you. <coughs> Brought a lot of nice things back from India, including a little cough. Thank, thank you, Susan. We had a, a lovely evening last night. I know not everyone could attend, in which the, those pilgrims who could come, who weren't otherwise sleeping, because um, we arrived. Uh, when did we arrive? <laughs> <laughs> Friday afternoon, right, yeah. Um, came and shared some of their stories as best we could. So I don't so much want to recount the details of our journey, and I want to thank those of you who expressed your appreciation for the um, somewhat random postings I made from a cheesy cell phone, often late at night, which was the only time I had. It was a very intense schedule to sort of say what we were doing. Uh, I'll, uh, I'll maybe talk a little bit more about the adventures in particular on the blog that I do. But so in any case, I'd like to talk then more reflectively about the deeper aspects, if I can, as the journey is fresh. I've been numerous times to India, and every time is unique. 
But India is, as so many of my Indian friends say, both here and there, India is coming up. And so the freshness, the vitality, the youthfulness, the chaos, and the creativity, the sheer dynamic vitality of that land and that culture um, hits you like a ton of bricks coming off the airplane. I, I like to joke is once they stamp your visa, you get to start coughing. <coughs> because, uh, as some of my friends there say, we don't trust air you can't see, and so the air is thick. But so is the vibration. And it's a curious uh, contra uh, uh, distinction between that youthful vitality that you experience there, the old and the new, and yet what we go for is not that. We, we go there for the timeless, eternal, spiritual vibration of it. And on the subject of who is this son of man? This is the timeless eternal teaching, the great gift of India to the world, which is the divinity, which is, our, which is the only reality there is and who we are. Paramahansa Yogananda, whose teachings we follow here, predicted in his lifetime, he passed in 1952 and lived as an American citizen from about 1920, and he said that the time is coming when America and India will lead the planet into a new era. He didn't mean politically at all. He meant vibrationally. Using our reason and our willpower, our energy, the Western mind has, has explored the boundaries of science and, and nature and so forth. But without being guided by the higher power than the intellect, which is the intuitive presence of God, in our souls as our only reality, that power, the power of science and observation and will, can go run amok and we stand at the edge by which we um, are polluting our planet to its very death if we continue in this way. He foresaw, in other words, the divine will would bring together the tools necessary to cope with the powers that would arise in our hands, if you will, through the process of globalization and, and so forth. India is and has been described as the guru of the planet. Since time immemorial, it has spawned, as it were, saints and sages and rishis from the Himalayan in the north to the very south of India, time and time again. It is a culture that has never been destroyed, come and gone, are the civilizations of such places such as Egypt and the Roman Empire and many, many others. In the Old Testament, God said, if you could find 10 just men, 10, 10 of God realization, the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah would be spared. India has been spared, their culture has preserved even through the darkening ages in which um, ignorance was as rife there as here. Different practices in religion are as, as debased or ignorant at least there as here. And yet that eternal thread that God is one and God is all continues to be affirmed. We got to learn more about the uh, Hindu Renaissance, began in the late 19th century. It began politically with the so-called Sepoy Mutiny, in which Indians began to feel the first stirrings of nationalism. And it, in West Bengal, essentially Calcutta, there, there developed a renaissance of literature and the arts and of science and of God-realization in this little hut, this little house that you couldn't possibly find with a GPS in Calcutta, just around the corner from Yogananda's boyhood home, there is a, a room in which avatars gathered, saints and sages and devotees. Yogananda, yes, of course, his guru, Sri Yukteswar. Vivekananda, the great disciple of Ramakrishna. Sarda Devi, Ramakrishna's wife. The great disciples of Lahiri Mahashai, Lahiri Mahashai himself, they were all Bengali. Even Lahiri Mahashai, born and raised, or not born, but, but raised, in, living rather in Varanasi, in Banaras, was essentially Bengali. 
And even the political revolution that ultimately freed India under the leadership of Mahatma Gandhi, he came as a late comer to that renaissance. In fact, he was considered an outsider and an interloper. He had to prove himself because the real energy for the renaissance of Indian culture, both timeless and timely, took place right there in Calcutta, led in a simple room that cannot be found. And so we had the opportunity to experience the dynamic spiritual vibration of both the timelessness of India, but its timeliness in our age through a resurrected, if you, were, if you will, line of God-realized masters, not just one, but an entire line who came successively. We had the opportunity to go to the very spot where this lineage was born, where the reaffirmation of these eternal truths would come to the West and to the world in a new form, not Hinduism. We are not Hindus. This is a Sanatan Dharma, an eternal religion, because it's the eternal truth that we are the sons and daughters of God. We are souls. All creation, all nature, the yearning people like you and I feel for harmony with our fellow creatures, with our planet, with one another, that which is intrinsic to our souls that brings people together here, but which does not bring together most of the planet. Even religion is but a source for divisiveness. That is as, blasphem blas as much a blasphemy as I can imagine anywhere. And something new is needed, and something new was born in India. I made the point last night that it struck me in a very visceral way <clears throat> how it was that Varanasi, which is the oldest continuously occupied city on the planet, mentioned in, I forget what Morley said exactly, the Ramayana, uh, in some of the Vedas, was the birthplace of this new dispensation that we call the path of Kriya Yoga. Stripping away all the accoutrements of religi re churchianity, religion, I mean, we enjoyed and, and, and felt the power, actually, also. Of the, there we were on the banks of the Ganges at sunset, and these huge rituals erupt. And it's, it's really like a, it's almost like a, a, a rock star entertainment. I mean, it's loud, it's lights and costumes, but it's also very beautiful. You know, the, the, the arty that takes place at evening, the, I mean, it's just for whatever it might be on one end of the spectrum of consciousness, it is also an affirmation because the light is the eternal light. And whether they know it or not, whether the priests themselves are simply going through the motions and are the rock stars of the priesthood, I couldn't say. It seemed like it. They were very choreographed, but it was beautiful. But it was beautiful. It was beautiful. So you could see the one or you could see the other. And I think those of us sitting in our boat with hundreds of boats all sort of bobbing together in the waves of the Ganges there just offshore, it was beautiful. It was the eternal affirmation of something, I'm not sure how many Hindus even realize what they're doing, no different than Catholics or Baptists and a number of other people. But still, armed with these great teachings that have stripped away and show us the essence of that eternal light which is all truth and all things and ourselves, we can see the wonderful, the beautiful affirmation and hear the mantras and feel their power even if we couldn't know what they were. There's many of our pilgrims commented that Varanasi is in some ways as ugly, frankly, as it is, as, as dirty as it most certainly is, as crowded and noisy as it most certainly is, once again, it's as if the assault on the fire, you know, we discovered why the yogis learned to go breathless. <laughs> <laughs> they're not stupid. <clears throat> Everywhere in India, they're burning incense, they're burning garbage, everything's burning. It's, I don't know, they take this yagya business, fire ceremony <laughs> business, way too far. <laughs> but there it was. You could not ignore those, who, those, who came, those of us who came with open hearts. You could not, you looked, we did this wedding ceremony at sunrise. Talk about knocking your socks off. We went across the Ganges in the pre-dawn hours, just floating silently, chanting the Gayatri mantra 
at sunrise, which has been chanted for thousands of years. I mean, it just, it just leaves you speechless. We docked on the other side, which is essentially a giant sandbar in the low flow season, and uh, conducted this wedding ceremony. And um, at least for where I was positioned, I looked out across the whole panorama of Varanasi. And in the dim light of the rising sun, bathed in the golden light, it, it just, it was a city of light. You could feel that eternal power walking through its crowded lanes, being jostled and pushed and hassled by vendors and beggars and so forth. Um, you know, your soul could soar or not, just depending <laughs> whether it was your soul or your, or your ego <clears throat> uh, up top at that particular moment. But it challenged our senses. Uh, Ear, nose, and throat <laughs> are just very much assaulted. But it gives you the opportunity, which is why we go, to transcend the view of the ego, the discomforts of the body. India represents the transmission of consciousness through human consciousness. The West has represented the ideals of, of justice and law and the institution of dogmas and precepts and of right behavior and right and ritual. But India, despite all of its cha own challenges through the darker ages that we have come out of, beginning to come out of, I should say, um, nonetheless has held high and uppermost that God does appear on earth in human form as the promise of our own immortality, because that's what we are. The great Vedic mantra, Tattvamasi, thou art that, shines eternally in that land through her great saints and rishis. It is a land of avatars. Everywhere we'd go, there were the footsteps of the masters who lived God-realization. And yes, the darkness comprehends it not. The street vendors, the camel drivers, the elephant riders, the vendors, the most people, therefore, everywhere, are in, inured to it. The ashrams of Swami Sri Yukteswar, one at the seaside um, of Puri, towards the south along the uh, east coast, and his hermitage uh, north of Calcutta <coughs> in Sri Rampur, um, are crumbling practically disappearing into the dirt. There are simply ashrams or signs posted in the neighborhood and so forth. But the average person, probably the neighbors themselves, don't have a clue. You can't see what you aren't are, what you aren't. You can only see yourself. And so it is the world swirls around and, and pays some homage. I must say more homage in a land like India where for the Kumbh Mela, which just ended when we got there, millions I don't think there's a spiritual gathering anywhere on the planet that has gone on for thousands of years where millions of people come. Sure, they may be ignorant and foolish in many respects, but as we know from the stories of autobiography, also come saints and sages to bless the, the sorrows and troubles of the multitude. What a land, what a land rich. Before it was conquered, it was also rich in material resources and human resources. And we see that wealth, which is its vibrancy and its great gift, taking place in the cities and everywhere. To, we went up in the Himalayas and the amount of development taking place there, which we can decry, but they need, and it's good, is taking place in 40, 50 years. The, the Himalayas are so beautiful you cannot imagine. They're not just mountains. When I saw the beautiful mountains, which I so enjoy even yesterday, um, doing things. Um, it's beautiful. But in the Himalayas, you look up and you look up. <laughs> <laughs> but it's not just mountains. Every Indian yearns for the Himalaya. It's a symbol for f moksha, for freedom. And along those hills, you c it, it'd be easy to live in the, the places. It's 1,500 miles wide. It's two to 300 miles wide. It's vast, and it is so incredibly beautiful. In the lower Himalayas is mixed. You can see, we saw rhododendron trees just in bright, 
brilliant red. You'd see mangoes, you'd see papayas, you'd see roses, you'd see geraniums. It, it is a land truly wealthy, blessed by the footsteps of the masters who have lived there. An incredible place. It's up to us now, because it's not for everyone, going there isn't this, quote, solution. It is up to us in this new age to Saints and sages have come to our land, Paramahansa Yogananda, for those of us here as part of Ananda. And the other great transmission that we got to appreciate, yes, we went to all these places. Would we appreciate a rock more than a living conscious being? We had satsang with Swami Kriyananda there in Pune. And it was obvious that we could not have even been on the trip had not that human being known as Swami Kriyananda, taken initiation at the feet of a true guru, Paramahansa Yogananda, and dedicated his life to his last breath, to serving his guru, to serving the transmission of consciousness, which can not, does not come through mere rocks or old buildings. You know the temples of India? They're not very old. I think the oldest thing there is probably a thousand years old that's still functioning. It was all built in the dark ages. You, who are you kidding? All things of the past have been destroyed. It's the transmission of consciousness that lives forever. Lahiri Mahashai wrote nothing. He said, through the, through the bulwark, through the ages of consciousness is how these things will be preserved and were preserved through the dark ages. And now, through the dispensation of Babaji to Lahiri in that little cave in which we meditated, where it all began, Babaji initiated Lahiri, bringing to his recollection his past life and, in, and blessed him with the dissemination of the path of Kriya Yoga. Lahiri asked Babaji right there in that spot where he meditated, could I release people from the stricter vows of things like celibacy and renunciation so that worldly men and women could have direct perception of God without intervention of priests and this sort of thing and rites and rituals in the inner cave of meditation. A new ray of light has come to earth through the great masters of this path and it is encircling the globe. And those of us who are privileged to go see the birthplace of this ray could feel that power. But we are the transmitters. We are the light bearers. And I realize the reason Swami Kriyananda comes to each of these centers and this and that is he is transmitting the power of God realization into each of the so-called colonies, the communities such as Seattle, because new places of spiritual power must be born in this new age. And it must be born in the new world for which Columbus sought, though he missed the boat and he didn't find any Indians, but we are here to do so. And this, this transmission is what came to me most, most vibrantly. And it's up to you and I to live the Sanatana Dharma, the eternal religion of our oneness in God, first in silent meditation to con contact that realm of stillness, and then in selfless service to humankind as manifestations of that great light. It is a, a privilege to be part of this transmission. Let's just have a moment of silence.